<clears throat> okay. Sorry, I had something of a coughing, sniffling fit, kind of in the middle of one of those videos, so I basically just decided to scrap the whole thing and start over again. So forgive me if I sound a little bit uh, repetitious here, it's because I am, but obviously you don't know it. This is the episode, Heroes and Demons, which has to do with, uh, most people refer to it as the Beowulf episode. It's the one where the Doctor goes in on his first away mission. It is primarily, and indeed almost entirely to the point of exclusion, a Doctor episode. And I think it's one of my, it's, a, it's a, among my favorites of Season 1. I'll get, I'll get to that more later when I actually finish Season 1. Now, I want to quote something really quick here. If I may, this is just dramatic irony. It's actually kind of rare that I do extensive research on these episodes because I've already done most of the research on these episodes and most of the facts that I care about, I remember because, uh, believe it or not, I have a decent memory, just not for things like names. In any case, I'm just going to quote this here, okay? Uh, Despite not appearing within this episode, this installment was among Ethan Phillips' favorites, in common with both Meld and Resolutions, from the first two seasons to watch, as he preferred watching episodes in which he was either completely absent or had a few scenes. For those of you who don't know, Ethan Phillips plays Neelix. That's the punchline. <laughs> I, I just, wow. I, that is so sad, and once again I find myself feeling so strongly for Ethan Phillips and for Kate Mulgrew, and for several other actors actors like Tim Ross. Now, I actually have quite a few notes on this one, so let's begin right off the bat here, okay? Now, uh, as usual, I'm going to talk about future, advan future events in the present, because that's kind of the way my mind works, but we find out towards the end of this that, as a result of them unintentionally kidnapping some photonic life from some nearby area. The photonic life then kidnaps some of their crew members off of the holodeck back, okay? Now that all makes perfect sense. The catch is, if you watch the episode knowing this especially, and I actually had to rewind and rewatch it and be like, what, really? They capture, they do the photonic scene, they beam over the photonic life, they fix the, the containment cell, they check it, and they're like, okay, I'd like this in six hours. And then they say, hmm, we should get Harry Kim out on this. Janeway to Harry Kim, and he's gone. I mention this because anytime I see something like this, it feels like something that the writer either didn't fully think through, or they didn't actually time out, or they just didn't care enough about to bother with. In other words, no matter how you how do you cut this, this is this is bad. This is a negative. The total time elapsed. I didn't actually time it, uh, or. I, rather, I forgot to write it down, between them kidnapping the enemy life form and the life form deciding to kidnap them back is somewhere around two minutes tops. That's pretty fast, and actually seems rather jarring in, in retrospect. And in fact, I almost feel like it was done on purpose specifically to make you not think that the two facts were related because they happened so close to each other that it would be like as if you're walking along and all of a sudden you're like, hey, here's a nice wallet, and then you turn around and then your car is gone, be and someone stole your car because you stole their wallet. I know this is a weird example, but that's kind of my point. The disjointedness of it really didn't work for me. I, I thought I felt that there were many different ways they could have uh, started that scene out. By the way, most of this, the be beginning part of this this video, this rumination, is probably going to sound negative, and I make no apology for that, especially since the latter half of it is going to be almost universally positive. I like this episode, I really do, but bear with me. <sighs> We've already had a holodeck episode. We've already gone to the holodeck and actually had it be a part of the story. Uh, I, I guess that's a lie. We haven't had a true holodeck episode. This is the first. But I, I'm just... <laughs> Something about the holodeck has always bothered me from a viewer perspective and from a production perspective, okay? In fact, I have a note further down here. Uh, where is it? I have no idea where it is. But anyways, there's a note somewhere on here that I wanted to talk about the holodeck, and I guess I'll just talk about that right now. Oh, here it is, right here. The holodeck appeal, that's all I wrote right here. From a writing perspective, the holodeck is a beautiful tool because it allows you to do things you normally couldn't within a science fiction show, right? For example, uh, not, to, not to really go into the point, but both Farscape and Babylon 5 really didn't... Uh, they had a few episodes that you could qualify as holodeck episodes, but they never actually had a holodeck episode. They never had a fake reality... Well, okay, that's a lie. Farscape had several fake reality episodes. <sighs> Which I guess kind of highlights my point, but uh, most of those were parodies or off-the-wall type of episodes. Of holodeck episodes. <sighs> I I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this properly. 
I think what bothers me most about holodeck episodes is the ultimate concept that they seem to be executed very poorly most of the time. Now, let's make this clear. There have been some holodeck episodes that are phenomenal. Both Elementary Dear Data and, um... Uh... I can't think of the name of the episode. Clockwork... Uh, no, no, no. Ship in a Bottle. That's it. Elementary Dear Data and Ship in a Bottle are both fantastic episodes and were very clearly and definitively holodeck episodes. That was an excellent way to go with it. Um... <coughs> Excuse me. I'm having trouble coming up with another one, so you'll have to forgive me here. My goodness. Yeah, I got another I'm sure there's a couple others, and, and maybe some of you out there could share some of your ones where you felt they did holodeck properly, but none, none of those are leaping to mind immediately. Which is kind of my point. Most people use the holodeck as... a crutch. I've talked about this concept before. There is a difference between a tool and a crutch. A tool is something you use to augment, enhance, or otherwise make possible something you are trying to accomplish through your endeavors. A crutch is something you lean upon in order to take place of your own efforts because you either lack the capacity or don't want to put forth the effort into that. Now, I'm talking about in writing terms, obviously, not in real life terms. So, the holodeck, more often than not, is a crutch, not a tool, and thus... It, all, it, 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 it tends to be used in, in cliché ways or in non-interesting ways or in ways where it's just like, yeah, okay. Now, I'm going to really talk about the holodeck a lot more in a coming episode. Um, the last episode of season one, I can't think of the name of it right now. But when we get to that episode, I will be talking about the holodeck in more detail. I wanted to mention it here because this is the first true holodeck episode, and I want to mention one other thing really quick. And like I said, I'll go into this more detail later. There is a vast difference between the appeal to us, the viewers, within the holodeck, than there is within the appeal to the writers in the holodeck. And that is something I think they never really picked up on. That's all I'm going to say now. Like I said, I'll cover that topic more later, because it's more relevant later. Um, let's see, next point here. I also like the fact that the holodeck malfunctions, the safeties are off, they can't override it. All of this happens literally within about five minutes of the start of the episode. In fact, it happens before the teaser finishes. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to... Oh, God. I'm having some issues with my throat all of a sudden. Oh, excuse me, I, I am deeply apologetic. I really don't want to do this a third time, so let's just try and do this. My point is, it seems rather cliché to the point of stupidity that they they already have a holodeck malfunction, they already have a safeties off, that all of the standard holodeck cliches that are used in the crutch holodeck episodes have already been employed literally before the teaser ends, right? Now, I am going to give them a bit of a pass on this for reasons that I'll get into more in detail later, but I just felt it was worth mentioning because all the actors involved, all the, all the characters involved, present these lines as, as if they're common day appearance. Like, for example... Um, if I'm drinking from my soda here, okay, I'm like, and there's a break in my straw, all right? I look down and I go, oh, shoot, there's a break in my straw, oh, well. And I'll either get another straw or I'll just pull up the lid and start drinking it like that, right? Completely not a big deal. That's exactly the same attitude they approach this with, huh, the holodeck's malfunctioning. And, huh, we can't override it. And, huh, the safeties are off. Okay. <laughs> I almost think that's done on purpose specifically because they didn't want to dwell on that point, and yet at the same time, they, they, they that it was basically something that they felt they had to do, and then they just kind of like, okay, okay, let's move on. Like, like they, they had to establish the scene and establish, okay, this is a holodeck episode, standard rules, everyone, you know, all the holodeck safeties are off, and we can't turn it off normally, blah, 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 same rules as always, and they just wanted to get that over with as quickly as possible. Which they certainly succeeded at, because as I mentioned for for the third time now, or fourth, or whatever it is, it's over before, all this happens before the teaser ends. My god, man. Now, I also made a note here, which is very simple. It's called The Problem with Guest Stars. One of the things I've theorized in the past is that one of the problems Voyager had, especially, is budget. Those of you out there who may or may not be aware of this, Voyager actually had quite a few threats of cancellation, uh, especially early on. And... When you are under a circumstance like that, your budget tends to shrink automatically because the studio and the, and the funding and the backers are less likely to give you a chance, which is ironic because that doing so makes it more likely for the show to be canceled, but, you know, whatever, let's just move on from that concept. So, 
Voyager had a lot of problem with budget, and this is very obvious in the first two seasons. In fact, it isn't until much later in the show that they start to actually have a budget that they can do stuff with, and they do do it with it. Pro props to them for getting there. But this really shows up when we have bad guest actors. Let me pull out an episode from TNG, for those of you who've seen it, called uh, Angel One, I believe. It's the episode with the matriarchal society in uh, Season One, I believe. One of the wor one of the bad episodes of Season One. And I know some of you out there are thinking, there's a good episode in Season One? I'll cover that later. In that episode, the the actress they picked in order to play the uh, the main matriarch, the actual one who was in charge of everything, uh, the elected one, that's what they called her, was a bad actress. There's absolutely no saving that. And her performance was so bad that even though the rest of the episode was bad, her performance by itself made it worse. That's because they had such... That's because they they had a budget problem, again, with TNG. You know, TNG didn't actually resolve its budget problems until about halfway through Season 2. Uh, and more accurately, it wasn't until Season 3 that they really started doing things properly, but moving on. So, again, this is just a reality of television. You know, I, I've talked before about my story idea of the Primes. No, I haven't forgotten about it. In fact, I've actually put, put a great deal more additional detail into it since the last time I mentioned it, several weeks ago. And I, I've said... If I had, you know, if I had the power of the Q, if I had an absolute wish that I could do it to any extent, what would I want to do with it? I would want to make a television series because a long, multi-season, multi-year storyline arc for something like that would be basically perfect for the length and depth and complexity that I would want to do for that story. My second choice would be a book, for anyone who's curious, and my third choice would be a video game, but moving on. But if I were to do that, one of the caveats, and this is extremely important, is budget would have to not be an issue. Because... When you hire bad guest stars, or when you have bad effects, or when you can't show something, the story suffers for it. Keep in mind, this is an episode I like. And yet one of the things I have to mentally push myself past every time I watch this episode is the fact that I'll bounce between Robert Picardo, who is an amazing theatrical actor, and guest stars who wouldn't be good in a Mountain Dew commercial. No offense to Mountain Dew, but I'm just general quality of acting here I'm talking. And it literally will go back and forth between like this. I feel like I'm getting, I'm getting whiplash every time I watch this episode, because it's literally like, yes! Oh, yes! Oh, yes! You know, th th that's literally how I felt watching this episode. And that is a problem in here in the real world. And it's not until later on in a show that you can actually do proper stories like that. And yet, as I already mentioned, ironically, you can't... You can't just hold back. You can't just do your bad stories now or your simple stories now and then hope that you, you, you the show takes off and then you can get the budget later to do the, the expensive stories later because if you do that, you have, you're probably shooting yourself in the foot and making it more likely you're never going to get that budget. You follow me? It's, it's a complicated dance. So I give... It's not that I give Voyager credit. It's that I am more lenient. I am more inclined to be sympathetic about these things because every single one of the, the guest stars, with, with the exception of the woman... Um, Majory or Mannery or something like that. I, I apologize, I can't remember her name exactly. I did actually look it up. Uh, does actually a decent job. But the person playing Unferth and the guy playing Hrothgar, oh, terrible, absolutely terrible. And given how many lines they had, really? You know? And what actually kind of baffles me is, is how many guest stars that are regulars in Star Trek. I, I mentioned uh, just a few episodes ago about... Um, Vaughn, and uh, I, I can't think of his full name. I see I have a terrible memory for names. I don't know why, but Vaughn, the guy who played the Romulan in the episode uh, Eye of the Needle, is a, is, an, is a great actor. He could have done much better about. It. I would have much rather seen him than he is a madman, my lord. He has come to you know. I'll, I'll, I digress. Let's move on here. Speaking of Unferth, this is actually a good time to bring this up. Unferth is, I like how I wrote this down, Unferth is the stereotypical school principal, corrupt lawyer, or uptight stick of wood. This is such a cliched character that it, bo it almost bothers me that it's in it. Uh, according to the writer who wrote this, yes, I really did do a significant amount of research in this. I don't know why. Um, he did this very much on purpose because it was his belief that a holodeck program would be just as cliche as entertainment is today. Now, I find that to be presumptive at best, but at the same time, I cannot cast judgment on it because it is entirely likely that someone 
uh, such as Harry Kim in this case, would actually want that, would want the stereotypical woman love interest, uh, although actually Freya is actually rather well portrayed, don't mistake me, would want the stereotypical, I am an obstacle to your thing, would want the stereotypical, I am a king who is ineffectual. You know, all three of these are actually very much stereotypical characters when it comes down to it. The only, the only reason this guy over here, Unferth, bothers me is his acting is so bad and his is his portrayal is so over the top that it, every time I see him I just kind of go I mean if I had walked on that holodeck and I assure you this is exactly what I do he would have been like oh I will fight me and I'm like no problem computer generate BFG <laughs> yes really I'm a geek what do you want from me I would have blown that guy and half of the wall to cinders and probably everyone else then I would have been like computer recreate everyone but Unferth <laughs> Because screw that guy. Or at the very least, I would try and program him to be a little more p reasonable or realistic. I, I admit, speaking as a writer and as a director, it is more difficult than it sounds to make a character not a caricature. It is. But God, really, guys? I'm done. Now, I have to say genuine props to Mulgrew. There is... I, I like the little moments that Voyager has. As I've said many times, Voyager actually does have quite a few small moments that elevated above bad show in my opinion even in amongst the bad episodes this is not a bad episode this just this is a good episode in my opinion but at one point in time they they're talking about uh, Tuvok and Chakotay are on the holodeck and they're both reporting into Janeway and they tell them tell her they think Karim has been killed Janeway says I, I can't emulate it so forgive me but she says killed actually that wasn't that wasn't a bad emulation she says it with a quiv quiver in her voice she says it with a genuine thing of no you know just this, this moment of no, you know. And then for the next few lines she has, as they start to figure, trying to figure out what's going on, there is a genuine note and expression of concern in her face. Definite props to Mulgrew for getting that across. It's, it's so rare to see Janeway portraying someone who is so very clearly human, because even though she's the captain, even though, you know, larger than life, all that, in this moment, all of that literally drops. It just fl f drops away, and, and there you see a person who is genuinely worried about someone who has possibly died and someone they care about who has possibly died. And I really like that, so very much props to Mulgrew for that. <laughs> I just feel like mentioning this very briefly. <clears throat> Why would photonic energy be on the holodeck? Uh, that's not me asking it. That's a line from a character in the episode. I'm going to raise my eyebrow at you a bit, and then I'm going to move on. <laughs> I also have a note here. Uh, Tom caring equals good. As I've said before, Tom Paris is arguably my second favorite character on the show. I say arguably because it kind of bounces bet between him and the Doctor. Both of them, I think, are very well done characters. And, uh, and Tuvok, for anyone who's wondering. And I like the fact that as Taurus, you know, the engineer, and Janeway, the scientist, are both discussing the situation, it is Tom who, A, says, we have to do something about this. He is he is literally leaping down their throats. He is like, no, we, we have to go. I refuse to accept that they're gone. We have to go do something. Because, as I've said many times, what Tom Paris is, at his core, is a moral, um, grounded individual who who cares, you know? that That's basically his character in a nutshell. The only thing you could add to that is he's competent in everything. And, and it's not really a joke. Uh, if you've watched Sci-Fi Debris, Sci Fi Debris Show, you'll understand what I mean. But even if you've watched Voyager in general, you'll understand what I mean. Tom Paris tends to be competent pretty much across the board. Speaking of which, the very next thing Tom does is immediately come up with an actual solution to their problem. Just like that. Because Tom Paris is competent. It's, it's awesome. I love it. He's the one who suggests the Doctor comes onto the show. And now we get to the point as to why I love this episode so much. I, this is not. Pro I, I would probably say this is something along the lines of an eight out of ten if I really had to think about it, but which is pretty high for a season one episode, mind you. But the Doctor and his interactions with this are all of why. Really, it is. I mean, obviously there's better episodes, but damn. I have a couple of little notes here. I'm going to mention first. Uh, there's a scene where Janeway is basically briefing to the Doctor what's going to happen. I'll talk about that in more depth in a moment. But then Kes, Kes is standing there the whole time. I mentioned this almost as a nitpick, but it does hamper the scene. Again, this is speaking as, uh, this is director Arshay and Gaia speaking here. Kes is just standing right here. Hang on, let me make sure I can see myself here. Okay, there. Kes is standing right over here. The doctor's like, rub, 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 and Janeway's over here, going, rub, 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 rub. and then I'm like, rub, 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 rub. Yes, I'm apparently the adult on Charlie Brown. And then the doctor goes and sits down and starts prepping, and then Jane Kess follows him. 
And at this point, Doctor has a line which is so out of place, it's something along the lines of, Oh, hello, Kes, as though she just walked in, you know, to the sick bay, as though she hadn't been standing there and observing this whole thing the whole time. Not sure what they were thinking of that. And it was just awkward enough that I noticed it, and I had to rewind. I was like, yeah, she was right there. What the heck? I, it, it seemed so out of place. It's like the director missed part of the script and was like, here, Kes, stand there. Kes is like, okay. Do I have any lines? No, not until the next scene. Okay. Now, there's a couple of big notes in here uh, that I want to cover in more detail later in episodes where they are more su uh, significant. But there is one note I have right here. And I want to make this note now because I kind of want to get it over with, okay? Let me make this absolutely clear. I'm not saying this for uh, scare or, or, or shock value or anything like that. This is something that I feel does have to actually be discussed, okay? Hollow sex, alright? In this episode, we see that Freya is very clearly t smitten with Schweitzer, a.k.a. the Doctor. Um, I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. And it is not unreasonable to assume that Freya was designed within this holodeck program to be smitten with whatever person happened to be the main lead. With me so far? And she pretty much says flat out, you know, it, it comes leap with me. I mean, she actually says, you know where I, you know where I sleep or you know where I rest or something like that. You know where my bedchambers are. It doesn't get much more overt than that, really, other than saying things that I don't feel like saying on my show. Why do I bring this up? I have been a Trekker for a long time, since the original series, actually. And uh, the, t the end of the original series, obviously. I'm not that old. <laughs> and one of the things that has been avidly discussed, to, to almost an embarrassing degree, ever since TNG, ever since the very first episode, First Contact, is, or I'm sorry, Encounter at Farmpoint was the first episode, is the concept of using the holodeck for sexual purposes, for sexual enjoyment, okay? One of the things I've found is that everyone tends to have completely different viewpoints on that, too. I am not going to share my opinion, for the same reason I don't share opini my opinion on anything that I find to be a volatile subject. I just want to discuss it as neutrally as possible. I have heard some people say that hollow sex with a holodeck character who is designed for that purpose is fine. I have heard some people say that if they have a character who is not designed to, to have sex with you, but nevertheless you, through your interactions with them, do successfully uh, grow close to them, or they grow close to you, or you seduce them, or whatever, then it's okay. In other words, if it progresses more naturally, as we've discussed before, and as I've... I, I, I gotta put this boilerplate on anything when I'm talking about the holodeck. Holodeck, sentient, okay? at the very least partially sentient, because it has the ability to be dynamic. I've, I've talked about this a billion times. So in other words, if you have a female character, and you are a male character, and you two spend some time, and the, the, the computer records all this information, and keeps track of, of this, and you know, it's a continuing thing rather than her character being reset each time you start the program, then it is possible that you, that this character will eventually be deduced to have gotten close to you, and then get romantically attracted to you, and then become sexually attracted to you, and then you actually have something happen, right? I know some people think that's okay, because it progresses more naturally. I know some people that say it's okay if you're reproducing someone on the holodeck that that, that you know, that you have their consent. Uh, well, I, I'm not going to name any names, but I could name a few women, yes, plural, that um, would be okay with me, if I had a holodeck, they would be okay with me putting it on there, and I could name some women who I would be okay with putting me on the holodeck, right? Okay, that's just, some people think that's okay. Some people think it's it, it, there's absolutely no restrictions, you know, it's just a holodeck character, it doesn't matter. I know some people that think it's okay if it's someone you don't know. Like, literally, if it's, if it's only okay if it's a fictional character, either uh, a celebrity of some kind, or literally a fictional character. Um, uh, I'm actually failing at coming up with one. Uh, Lara Croft, there we go. The most stereotypical example possible. Like, if you wanted Lara Croft to be on there, that's okay. I'm just bringing up all these points because I've heard so many different viewpoints. There's actually more, and I don't want to go into full detail, but I've heard all these different viewpoints, and... <sighs> without a full and true definition of the rights of sentience within this context, that is to say, does the computer that runs the holodeck, which is at least partially sentient, have rights? Because that is a debatable question. Without that being defined, I cannot, within good conscience, say any of these are correct or incorrect. If we are to assume, if we are to take down and lay down the rule that this, the, this computer, that this holodeck, does not have the same rights as, say, the Doctor, or Data, or other sentient life, 
then it is my, then it is my viewpoint that all of these things are opinions. These are not things that can be couched in fact. These are not things that can be stated to be morally correct or incorrect. They are a matter of opinion, and therefore none of them are wrong, if you follow me. But if we take away that rule set, the, the issue becomes a lot more complicated, and this is something that really deserves to be discussed in a great deal more depth than I care to go into right here and right now. This is literally just me trying to give you a bit of a summary of the problem. But this is a very real concept, a very real issue that should be thought about. If you have a holodeck, and you create a program that you go into to enjoy, to relax, to have your time off, and you have a holodeck character within that that you have programmed, or, or the programmer has programmed, to be romantically interested in you and to have sexual relations with you, is there anything wrong with that? Is there anything uncomfortable about that. I know people who wouldn't even consider that cheating. I know some people who would consider that cheating, for if, if they were with someone, obviously, is what I mean. I know some people who wouldn't care one way or another, who would have no opinion on the matter. I bring it up because it is something that I feel should be discussed in more detail. I'm not going to do so now. I'm going to do so much later when it comes up a lot more than this. But I felt this was the this is the first real example of it. Um, since the TNG days. There were a few episodes in TNG, but obviously I'm doing Voyager first, where this kind of a problem comes up. I'd also like to point out one other thing here. Over on Deep Space Nine, we know for a fact that the Hollow Suite's original purpose was that. Hollow sex. Pretty much 100%. In fact, we have an episode in which... Uh, I don't remember the episode, so you'll forgive me, but... Uh, Jake, Cisco's son, is going up to the holodeck, and Odo looks at o looks at Quark like, "You're kidding, right? I better go tell Cisco." And and I'm, I'm paraphrasing. And Quark says, "No, no, 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 no. I, I we don't do that sort of thing anymore unless you pay for it." No, now and and Quark tells him how he's repurposed the holo suite, so now they can do you know normal holodeck stuff, right? In other words, the only thing that you did up there previously was holo sex in some form or another, 100% of its purpose. And to be a little bit honest, of course that's what it was. Do you know, I mean, granted, Star Trek is a different society from ours, but do you know how popular that would be for that purpose alone here in the modern age? For the record, no, I wouldn't do that. Um, I'm, I, like I said, I don't want to give my opinion on the right or wrong of it, but I don't see any appeal in there, personally. That's not me, and uh, that's getting into things that I don't want to talk about. But in all honesty, I, I, don't, I don't get the point. It'd be the same as watching a porno movie. I, I don't get it. Uh, anyways... I've talked about this enough, and I will talk about it more later, <laughs> but I just wanted to get that out of the way. Now let's talk about the Doctor. That's basically what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this thing. Uh, let's talk about the name first, because that's going to be shorter to talk about, because the next thing is several points. Well, actually, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to put the name off, I apologize. Let's, talk, <laughs> let's, let's really start with the beginning here. The Doctor, for his entire life, if you could even call that, his existence growing into life, has been confined to sickbay. Now, looking back on this, it's kind of strange to think about it. Because we've seen the Doctor do so much, and go to so many places. And, I might add, that looking back, e even at the time, actually, even up until that point, the idea of someone being totally confined to a single room is something that is hard to wrap our minds around, because we see the rest of the ship all the time, and we see the rest of the people coming in and going out and talking to the Doctor and interacting with him all the time, and we see him on the view screens, you know, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't really click until you actually think about it that the Doctor is literally a prisoner of that room. Now, I'm not saying that he's... He's, he's a prisoner of that room the same way we people are prisoners of this our bodies, right? We cannot leave these bodies uh, that we know. And so we are confined to what we can do with these bodies, right? The doctor is confined within that sickbay, within the room that is his his body. That's what I mean when I say prison. I don't mean he's in shackles or whatever like that. But I mention this because it's a very powerful concept when you start to think about it. And it is this concept that provides the gravitas and the groundbreaking necessary for this entire episode to come fruition. If it wasn't for the Doctor and his method and this theme that I just mentioned, this episode would have flopped horribly, in my opinion. Especially since the first 20 minutes, or well, actually more like 10 minutes, of the episode was just kind of like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. But then the Doctor comes onto the screen. Actually, then Tom comes onto the screen, and I'm like, yeah! And then the Doctor comes onto the screen, and then I'm like, yeah! Um, he starts talking with Janeway, and they start discussing this mission, and Picardo does a beautiful job of portraying nervousness in such a 
almost casual manner. It's really well done. He is obviously nervous, but he is not nervous in a way that's obvious. Does that make any sense? He is portraying his nervousness as someone who has never actually experienced nervousness before, and his conversation with Kess really nails that fact down. Why should I be nervous? I can do emergency surgery without even blinking. I can do all these sort of things. You know, I, I'm, I am, I, I've done all these things. And then Kess points out the obvious and the thing that most of us tend to forget when we get nervous. Those things are familiar. This is something new. If I was to... Uh, be playing, uh, let's see, what, what's one of the games I was really good at? Warcraft 3. Warcraft 3 was one of those co co uh, competitive games that I was actually quite good at. And if I was playing Warcraft 3 in front of a huge audience, I wouldn't be nervous because I know this. I mean, okay, I'd be a little nervous, I'll be honest. But at the same time, I wouldn't be like, oh my god, oh my god. It'd be more like, okay, I can do this. Yeah, let's go, let's go. You know, I'd be, I'd be getting pumped rather than being, say, if you asked me to get in front of a huge stage and, uh, and recite Macbeth, okay? Uh, yes, I've actually done that. Uh, that's a bad example. Hang on, let me think about something I really don't know. Um, okay. If you wanted me to give a tour of the Louvre, the Louvre, I, I can't even pronounce it right, <laughs> I would be going, now I would know a decent amount about some of the paintings in there. Some of them. And then I'd come up to a painting and be like, uh, here's a painting. It's nice, I guess, and it's really well done, and I could probably analyze some of the artistic styles in it, but I don't know that much about painting, so I would be very nervous because it's unknown. You, you follow me? So, I like the fact that they bring that simple humanity, ironically, into the Doctor's character in this manner. I, uh, I mentioned the name issue. I'm going to move ahead with that later, but one of the things I like very much is he had a quote that says, I cannot afford to fail, but I don't know what to expect. That is a brilliant quote and really speaks to his character in many ways. One of the biggest things that defines the Doctor's character... Whoops, there we go. Sorry, my cord got caught. Is the fact that he is literally programmed with a very strict code of ethics. And this will come up later, I'll mention it as well. And thus, in his mind, it isn't just, I want to succeed like any of us would. You know, we want to get Tuvok and Chakotay and Harry back. He must succeed. That is what he believes to not just be right and true, but to be necessary. And so from his perspective, we see someone who must do good, who must help, who must aid. And he has no idea how to do that in this case. And then we see, then thus we see another layer of that nervousness, another layer of why he's so worried. Because he is truly jumping into what he considers to be the unknown. Now... The very next scene is the next one I want to comment on, believe it or not. He he beams over, and... Uh, whatever, I'll just leave it there. He beams o onto the holodeck, and definite props to Ricard, uh, Picardo, or the director, or both. What's the very first thing he does? He gets goes and picks up the tricorder, something he knows, something he sees. And there's this pause, there's like a half a second pause as he's just... He's like, I have no idea what to do. And then he turns and he sees a tree branch. And the expression on his face, the sh sheer sense of genuine wonder in his, in his expression, in his portrayal, in his word choice, in the way he presents himself, all of it is right there. He, he grabs this branch and he's just like, I, I can't emulate it, but you know, he, he is so overwhelmed by the sensation of actually touching something of seeing something, of being somewhere else. And then, you know, Janeway's like, Doctor, oh yeah, well, well yes, I'm here, right? And then he says, yes, I'm here. And then they have a little bit of a conversation. And then he takes one of the flowers, and he actually smells one of the flowers. I don't know if that was done on purpose or not, or if it was just something that was thrown in uh, as, as another way of him demonstrating this sense of awe. But he literally stops and sniffs the flowers. I love that. I love that. And Picardo really pulls off the sense of the moment. He doesn't get campy about it. That's what I, that's one of the things I really like about it. He doesn't campy about it. He is very genuine and sincere in his awe and wonder ab about the, the concept of being someplace else. Imagine, if you will, you, right there, the person watching this video right now, is on the moon. Just like that. Let's, let's assume you can breathe and stuff, right? You are on the moon. Now, we've seen the moon. We know what the moon is. We know intellectually what the moon is. We know a great deal about the moon, actually, and other people have been to the moon. Have you ever been to the moon? Imagine that moment. Imagine what it would be like to look around and just pause in the moment of being on the moon. 
I'm actually I'm actually kind of smiling just thinking about it. You know, strong imagination. And actually think about the concept of looking up and seeing an Earth rise, and actually being able to gaze up at the stars and there's something about that moment that defies words and it is powerful and I think that Picardo's presentation of that throughout this whole episode most most especially in these first establishing scenes is one of the reasons this episode is so strong and thank god they got Picardo to do that I don't know if I've mentioned this before obviously I'm a huge fan of him but he's actually quite a theatrical actor he had quite a few credits uh, not in television well some in television before he come on to Voyager. This man was experienced and knew what he was doing. And I think one of the re strongest reasons Voyager succeeded as long as it did, all seven years, was because of Robert Picardo. I mean that sincerely. That man, A, had the only really planned story arc in the whole series up until Seven of Nine, and B, is a great actor. Enough said, you know. Now, let's move on. Uh, huh. Speaking of the Doctor and his portrayal, there are two really big, uh, well, there's two elements to his secondary character arc, which both began here in this episode. I'm not 100% sure if it was done intentionally or not, but it was definitely the beginning of his, okay, his primary character arc is the obvious one, his growth as a living being, his growth into a sentient being with rights and all that stuff. That's obviously the, char the Doctor's primary character arc. His secondary character arc is often described as his ego. Now, I've talked, I'm not, oh, no, I haven't talked about it. I haven't talked to you about this, but I've talked about the, the Doctor's ego, and, and one of the reasons why I use this when I say that. It's suffice it to say that it is my belief that the Doctor has the ego he does mostly as a defense mechanism, especially in later episodes, especially in later seasons, is because so often he feels that he is exceptional, or at the very least should receive recognition for his exceptionalism, and yet so few people actually acknowledge it as opposed to, uh, say, Data, who, well, obviously Data doesn't have emotions, but bear with me on a moment, Data never had any issues of feeling unworthy or unliked because everyone treated him as he was immensely valuable and, and actually gave him credit as a being, as a sentient being, stood up to defend him, no less. Uh, forgive me for bring, bringing it up again, but measure of a man. The scene at the end where Data talks to Riker about how Riker that action injured you and saved me. I will not forget it. Yes, I actually remember the quote. I love that episode. I could, I could almost recite that episode by heart. That quote shows so strongly the difference, the contrast between Data and the Doctor. And I'm not talking about this as a bad thing, necessarily. Data was well-received, well-valued from day two or so. You know, basically after the Naked Time or the Naked Now, whichever one it is. Data was someone who was considered especially unique and treated like it. He was treated as a valued member of the crew. The Doctor had to work for that. Uh, and he had help, by the way. The Doctor had to work for that, and he had help. And then he had to work for rights. And then he had to work for freedom. And then he had to work, you know, he had to crawl his way up, despite, in his opinion, A, being a valuable member of the crew, and, C, and, or, and B, having the emotions to actually have such a thing as wounded pride. That character arc begins right here with the very simple line. I actually wrote it down. He's just told uh, Freya about these these the poisonous. Uh, he actually mentions it. it was a, a form of amina, amanita, if I'm not mistaken. These poisonous mushrooms that they use, or this poisonous moss actually that they use in order to. Yes, I know they're the same thing. In order to brew up a certain type of brew, and you know it kills the weak, but it makes the strong stronger and stuff like that. And he's just so deadpan about it. By the way, I love that scene. It's very well contrast. And as they're walking away, she says, "Are you interested in herb lore?" And he says, "Well, yes, I guess I am." And and then he, she says something along the lines of. You are a man of many talents, my lord Schweitzer. Your people must value you greatly. And he has this line that's very quiet. You almost can't hear it. Well, obviously you can hear it, but it, it's definitely meant to be a, a, a secondary line, which is, you would think so. That line begins that whole character arc of ego right there. That simple line demonstrates so much of his character within with just uh, four, yes, I had to count, four simple words right there. Boom. Very well done. And later on, there's another scene, which I'm going to go ahead and skip down to. Where was that scene? Is it here? It is here. Another scene that's right along the lines of that is when all of them are shouting his name, being like, Schweitzer, Schweitzer, Schweitzer. 
So much of this episode is about new experiences for the doctor. His first time off the sickbay. His first time in an away mission. His first time encountering a, a new alien species. His first romance. And the first time he has received true praise from a number of people. Now, yes, these are holograms. I'll discuss that point in a little bit. But nevertheless, this is, again, relating to that point. It must have meant so much to the Doctor, who feels so underappreciated, it, it, pa well past this point, I might add, to have several people just charging and screaming his name. Yes! Yes! You know, just imagine, uh, whatever your name is. Let's say your name is Bob. Okay, Bob! 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 You know, there is something about that that it's hard to deny, that it is nice to feel appreciated, even if you don't have any big ego problems, even if you aren't a big prideful, oh, I'm the greatest guy in the world, or greatest girl in the world, or greatest robot in the world, you know, whatever. Even if you don't have any problems like that, even if you're a relatively humble individual, there is something nice about feeling appreciated. And I have no doubt that the Doctor enjoyed that as well. You'll notice I keep calling him to the Doctor. Like I said, I'll get to the name issue. I really will, because I want to talk about that basically at the end. Um... Speaking of which, another beautiful scene is is demonstrating... Okay, let me rewind a little bit here. Those of you who know me know that I tend to be a, a student of many different uh, fields of study. Many different fields of study. When people ask, what are your interests, I tend to say everything, because it's easier than going down and trying to list them all. It's just me. I, I, I thirst for knowledge. It's, it's the way I've always been. But one of the things I am genuinely good at is tactics and strategy. Um, this is one of the reasons I've gravitated towards war games on all three uh, all three levels of stra of t of operation, on many occasions. Not levels of operation, levels of of warfare. Uh, you know, tactical, operational, strategic, and I really tend to enjoy that sort of thing, right? So to me, this is kind of a duh concept. But the fact that they put it in at all was, n was is a nice touch because it's so rare that Star Trek acknowledges anything approaching actual tactics. What, what I'm referring to is the scene where uh, Unferth... God, I've already forgotten his name. Not good with names. That's not something I'm good at. I wrote it down somewhere. Hang on. Un Unferth. There we go. Where is it, Unferth? Oh, uh, well. The stick. Uh, says, you know, fight! And then Freya says, here, use my sword. And the doctor is like, oh god, oh god, oh god. And he's like, okay, this is dumb. Puts down the sword, stands there. The guy tries to swing at him, he injures him himself in the process, as he would by swinging a sword that hard and then hitting the ground. That would hurt. Thank you very much for any of you out there who have actually done swordplay. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And then the doctor leans down and has an awesome badass moment. I love this because it's so quiet. It's so in keeping with it. You know, most of the time you think of a moment like that as, you know doing the sunglasses thing, or maybe walking away from an explosion, but the doctor does it with quiet subtlety, just leans down and says, you might want to put some ice on that. And it was just a beautiful, I have owned you moment, that it was very, and it was subtle, and it was brilliant, and it was brilliantly done. But the, mo the tactics thing I'm talking about is very simple. <sighs> Fight an enemy on your own terms in a way that you are good at is really what I like to call it. I'm sure there's a Sun Tzu that actually refers to that specifically. I don't remember. I, I haven't read Sun Tzu in several years. But, yes, I'm talking about the Art of War. But that's basically what it means. The Doctor is not a melee fighter. Duh. This other guy is, <laughs> at least we're supposed to believe, his, his swordplay is absolutely pathetic, but whatever. We're supposed to believe he is a melee fighter. Okay. Fighting him on his terms, first of all, is a failed proposition. Fighting him on his terms in a manner he defines, melee combat, which is something you're not good at, not a good idea. The doctor then immediately turns it around and actually uses his brain and says, okay, we're fighting, we're still technically fighting on your terms, because the other individual inst instigated this fight, but now we are fighting in a manner that I am good at. So he turns off his uh, tangibility so the sword goes right through him. And at that point in time, the Doctor has effectively already won, because the moment he has decided the means by which they will engage in this contest, in a, in a manner that he is c competent at, with the opponent approaching him, it's like checkmate at that point, or checkmate in several moves at that point. It's un it's unavoidable, as long as you at least have a competent brain about the way you're approaching it, and he certainly did. I liked that acknowledgement. It's, it's kind of a minor thing, but I felt like pointing it out, because I like minor things. You know that. <sighs> I, I did actually count one thing. I want to mention this before I talk about Freya a little bit more. One of the things that has always bothered me about Star Trek is their concept of emergency time. Now, 
I don't know about how many of you out there have actually dealt with medical uh, emergencies or circumstances like that. I have on many occasions. I, I come from something of a medical background, uh, not myself, my family. And so I understand that literally seconds can determine lives. I understand that. I've seen that. That's not something that I can dispute, okay? So the concept of emergency to me means emergency. When I hear the word emergency, what I think of is now, because I know exactly what that means, right? In Star Trek, uh, this is true in s several forms of television as well, but in Star Trek especially, when they see emergency, they tend to mean, oh my god, we're trying to make this look more important than it is. At one point in time, the doctor is grasped, grasped by Grendel and calls for, and it says, get me out of here. And then there's a couple seconds pause. And then he says, now! And then there's a couple seconds pause. And then Janeway says, hey, hey, Tom! And then there's a couple seconds pause. And then Tom starts typing on the thing. And then there's a couple seconds pause. And then the doctor comes through minus an arm. I went down and counted. 13 seconds passed from the beginning of that problem, from the moment at which, if this would have been a real emergency, they should have already started the process, to them actually getting him out of there. Now, even if you say he had to do all that bumping thing, button thing on the thing, which I, I'm okay with, because don't, let's not forget the transfer of the, the doctor to the holodeck and back. This is the first time that's ever happened. That becomes commonplace later on. But this is the first time they have just invented a method of doing this within the confines of, of their technology and their knowledge right now. So I'm with the idea that it takes a few seconds to do that. But that actually emphasizes my point more. He, Anybody in, in, in okay, if they lost the doctor, that ship is dead. No, seriously, dead. I want you to con consider what it would be like to live in Star Trek and deal with every kind of medical problem in the known universe and have absolutely no way to do, deal with it other than Tom Paris, no offense to the man, and Cass, no offense to the woman. Yeah. So they, I don't know about you, but I would have treated him as a much more valuable asset in that. And, and ignoring any thoughts of sentience, he's the doctor. He's our only doctor. I would have been literally on the line listening. And the moment I heard him go, Captain, you know, and hearing the panic in his voice, I would already be typing in, okay, let's, let's get him back. Let's get him back. And taking uh, what, what was a grand total of about three and a half seconds to get him back. Boom. Just like that. Now, yes, he was fine. That's not my point. My point is Star Trek tends to treat emergency as, Oh my god! And that bothers me. Sorry about the rant. <laughs> now let's talk about some more positive things. The Doctor and Freya's interactions are nothing short of awesome. Now, I know that Freya was supposed to be something of a romance interest. I shouldn't even say something. She was de intended to be a romance interest. I've talked about this with the holosex thing. <sighs> Nevertheless, I feel that Believe it or not, the even though the speed at which she fell over him was very quick, and probably, especially within lore context, designed... Again, as I mentioned, it, it's not un unreasonable to, to think that the Freya character was designed to be a love interest for the Beowulf character. Even ignoring that fact, it is actually completely believable to me that she would fall for Schweitzer, given how different he is from everything and everything else she's... Ev everything and everyone else she's seen, and the general confidence he does actually exude, despite being completely different from the rest of them. Even though he he was in, you know awkward and, and odd at the dinner table, for example. By the way, love the scene at the dinner table. I'm not going to talk about it in the detail. I just want to add that he he portrayed a different kind of individual, and it's not hard to find something appealing in something that is so different and at the same time generally net positive like that. I also liked the way that it showed it, it portrayed his character because again, firsts. This is the first for him, and this is something that obviously had genuine impact on him. At least for the episode. I'll get to that towards the end, too. Um, there is another problem that I'm going to mention here in brief. I will be talking about this in length in the next episode. Cathaxis. Cathaxis. Star Trek tends to have a problem about we, the viewers, because we have brains. I've, I've been talking about this ever since Caretaker. Pick up on pertinent plot points or the mystery or whatever generally anywhere from the range from 5 to 30 minutes before the crew does. Sometimes that's because it's a bad episode, admittedly, but in another case it's just because they portray the characters as either stupid or unable to get the blindingly obvious. Again, I'll talk about this more in Cathexis, because that's where it really comes into play. But here, I also want to point out that it takes until virtually the end of the episode for them to get figure out what we figured out literally the moment Tuvok and Chakotay were taken. Gadur, basically. And I wish they'd stop doing that, but anyway. Uh, 
There's another scene, which I really like. Janeway and the Doctor are talking and explaining everything that the audience figured out 20 minutes ago. <laughs> I was just talking about this. But Jane, uh, the Doctor says, you know, I, I want to go back. I want to finish my mission. I want to do this, and I believe I can do this. And Janeway has a beautiful line. Uh, I forget the actual wording, I apologize. But it's basically, I believe you can too. She's putting genuine faith in the Doctor. This is a continuation of both of his character arcs in that one gesture. Him as a sentient being, and him as someone who should be valued. With this one gesture, Janeway so appropriately and so perfectly says both of these things to him. Not not literally saying, uh, Doctor, you're awesome, and you're a sentient being. No, no, no. She does it by by her presentation, by giving him this faith, and, and literally putting the lives of several of her crewmates in his hands in a manner that isn't medical. You know what I mean? It was an awesome gesture, and it was an excellent scene, and I just felt like adding that. Now, uh, one last point. Wait, hang on. Actually, uh, there's a couple other points here. I, I wanted to talk about the holograms in general. I'm sorry, I have so much talked about this episode. I hope most of you out there don't mind. Uh, God, this is already 50 minutes. My goodness. Oh, it, it always works like this, doesn't it? I do apologize. There is an obvious sympathy and empathy that the Doctor has with these holograms. And I, 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 there's no question in my mind this was done on purpose, especially since, like I said, I did the research and the writer says it was done on purpose. But the director agreed, and Picardo also agreed. Basically, the Doctor tends to treat the characters on the holodeck as people. Now, that may sound like a weird comment, but let me just put it into, into some perspective here. When Harry hopped on the we have to assume... When Harry hopped onto the holodeck, he probably treated them as... I'm trying to think how best to put this, because he wouldn't treat them as people, but he would treat them much more as characters, as as in individuals to interact with. Um, allow me to use a direct example. I apologize, it's going to sound egotistical. But when I play a game that I find immersive, Oblivion, Morrowind, Dragon Age, you know, any of the really greats, I tend to treat those NPCs as though they were relatively... Th not as if they were people, because they're not, and I know that, but I don't treat them as though they're NPCs. There's like a middle ground there, you know what I'm talking about? With just a little bit of respect and just a little bit of caring. It's like... Let me use the most obvious example I can think of. A lot of people cared about Eris's death in Final Fantasy VII. Spoiler alert. And obviously those people, at least most of them, I know a couple who went to extremes, but most of those people, the vast majority, myself included, did not think Eris was a person. Because of course she wasn't. She was a character. But that didn't mean we didn't care. We treated the character, Eris, with a degree of respect and a degree of sympathy and a degree of caring. We actually wanted her to have a happy ending. And the fact that she died, even though her story kept going after that, was nevertheless a heart-rending moment, okay? Now, that being said, that's probably how Harry was treating this, because this is his program, this is what he was doing. The same as we treat the characters in the video games we play. When Tuvok and Chakotay came on, the sh came on board the holodeck uh, much earlier in the episode, for quite a while, they don't even acknowledge Freya. Their portrayal of char people who are treating this as an NPC, as a, as a character who, who has no relevance whatsoever, is very obvious, very overt, and very well done, I might add. It really highlights the difference for what I'm about to talk about, because it's only until they, they feel like they are threatened. They are threatened that they start to be like, oh, okay, I guess we'll acknowledge you. In fact, the very first words out of their, mouth, out of their mouths are, computer delete character. That's how much they cared, or rather, didn't care. Enter the Doctor. The Doctor, by complete contrast, treats these p individuals, these characters, as people. Now, it can be argued whether or not they are. I talked about this earlier. That is actually a much smirkier issue and one I don't want to tackle right now. Even if they are not actually people, in, by definition, and I've no, and it, hell, even here in real life, we have some philosophical thoughts about the, about fictional characters and whether or not they can qualify as sentient or not, uh, given the sentience that has created them, if you follow me. But within the confines of the holodeck, even if they are not actually sentient people, even if they aren't you know, real by whatever definition you want to define real as, the Doctor treats them as real because he is a hologram. Because to him, they are real. Because he knows intimately and personally how much complexity is going into making them as interactive as they are. And so he treats them like they're people, just like he himself wants to be treated. 
that is one of the most powerful this is obviously the second uh, i would say the most powerful second most powerful element of the entire story the fact that he treats these individuals like people and there's two very strong examples of that which i'm going to go over right now number one his interaction with Unferth, where he almost doesn't kill him, and he has that beautiful line, which I not only wrote down, I highlighted three times. The only reason you won't die is that I've taken an oath to do no harm. I love that quote, because it says so much about the Doctor's character in, in every possible way. Number one, it says that he thinks killing this, this holodeck character would be killing him like as in killing a person, as in it would be violating his oath, which is programmed into him in, into such a way that he cannot violate it to do so. That's powerful right there. Number two, that shows just how much he was deeply affected by the events that just happened, which I'll be talking about in a moment here. And number three, it was just an awesome scene. I'm sorry, his portrayal of that, his delivery of that was amazing. It going immediately from, He's a bad man, my lord, to Ricardo, Picardo's perfect presentation of that line was, was again, that whiplash thing I was talking about earlier. It's just like, ugh. And then, whoa, that was awesome. You know, beautifully done. I'd also like to talk about very quickly the the fact that I like that the Universal Communicator not only wasn't working, but they got around it again. Very few episodes of Star Trek across all of the series actually have the Universal Communicator not working. Now, let's make something clear. I understand the need for the Universal Communicator. I really do. And I understand why it should be employed 95% of the time. And I agree with that. But I do like it whenever they, whenever they can't employ it and they get around it properly. Um... Oh, I can't think of the name of the episode. Darmok and Jalard at Tanagra. You know what I'm talking about. Over in TOG is a beautiful example of the communi universal communicator failing them and them having to communicate without being able to communicate, you know? This is another much milder example of that same thing. It is my belief that the, the photonic en entity had no idea what the doctor was saying. All it saw was the gestures. All it saw was another photonic life freeing the member of its family and in so doing, decided to reciprocate. In the same manner that it had previously kidnapped, when they kidnapped, they freed and it freed. It was the most basic type of communication, simple gestures. And yet I liked that, because sometimes simple gestures are all we have. I want you to imagine for a moment you meet someone who speaks a language that is so alien to yours. For me, that would probably be Chinese, because I know no Chinese. I know some Japanese, at least, but I don't know anything Chinese. And yes, I know there's more than one Mandarin, so don't get, don't get me out of that. If I met someone like that, communicating with that person would have to come down to that kind of thing. Basic gestures. Because... I can't, I, I can't understand them. And, and obviously for the, for the purpose of they wouldn't understand any of the languages I know. So, you get my point. I like that form of communicating without communicating, and I think this is an excellent example of that. <sighs> Let's talk about the big point. There's, uh, actually, I want to mention one other thing here. Right at the end of the episode, Janeway... I'll talk about this in more depth later, but she does have a line right at the end of that scene where she says, I have a feeling... You know, that something tells me that you're going to have, that this isn't your last adventure. And the doctor says, something tells me you're right, or something like that. I really liked that, especially the way it showed what it should what should have happened, actual character growth. Now, yes, don't mistake me, there was some actual character growth. The doctor did start branching out from the sickbay from this point on. G good on them for actually having some frickin' canon within this series, because Lord knows they've been dodging it every time it comes up since. But, well, let's get into it, shall we? Freya dies during the course of this episode. Spoiler alert. Now, I have ignored the name issue this entire time because this is the point at which it really comes up. And this is something, if I was writing this episode, I would really have caught in a You probably have noticed I haven't said anything about changes, and we're almost an hour into this. The only change I would have made is that I would have made all of these events canon, if you know what I mean. I would have made these events matter in the future. Anything else I would do is nitpicking and, and piecing together little bits and pieces. There's very little I would change about this episode. Uh, better guest stars, that'd be a nice step, <laughs> you know. But Freya dies... And the Doctor is obviously deeply affected by this. And then the Doctor picks up a sword. Now, 
that moment, that gesture by itself, speaks volumes. Obviously, he picked up a sword earlier, but that's because he was trying to get it into the, into the step of things. He rejected the sword by not only for tactical reasons, as I mentioned earlier, but because it is in his nature to do no harm, as he says towards the end. The mere act of picking up the sword with the look that he had on that face was a powerful moment. Now... Uh, I have to confess for a moment that I'm a total geek, because when I first saw this episode, the name Albert Schweitzer came to mind immediately. I knew uh, at least roughly who that was, and I was just like, wow, I'm really a geek, aren't I? Um, interesting uh, person to pick for his name, I might add. Not many people uh, would probably have, have chosen him as, as this character. <sighs> but the reason I, I've been ignoring the name issue is the very last time he hears that name is on Freya's lips as she dies. And again, I want to stress, from the doctor's perspective, this is a person who has died. No different from his perspective than any other member of the crew or any other person he knows. If Kess had just died... Well, actually, Kess is a bad example. He's pretty close to Kess. Let's, let's pick someone he's not very close to. Tuvok. If Tuvok had just died, the Doctor would have been affected by that. The Doctor knows Tuvok. The Doctor has interacted with Tuvok, probably has at least some passing friendship with him. And Tuvok just died, speaking his name, Schweitzer. That is a powerful moment, and it very clearly impacts him, and all that becomes all the more apparent as he bears down with the flames upon Unverth, with clear rage in his eyes. And he, and then he delivers that perfect line I've just mentioned, and does the scenes I've just talked about, and blah blah blah. But I bring all of this up because it all comes back down to the name. I have mentioned before that I would have handled the whole name for the Doctor thing differently because it is, in my honest opinion, that the Doctor should be called the Doctor, not, uh, you know, any of the other uh, Doctor Van Gogh, for example, as he is in that one episode. His name is Gaysman, or Doctor Schweitzer, as he is in this episode, or Doctor Zimmerman. <laughs> you know, it is my opinion that he should have stayed the Doctor, and I've listed uh, some of my reasons for that. This episode most powerfully illustrates why. Within this, one of the things I would have added as just a little bit of a coda is the fact that he, he already mentions that he does not want to be called Schweitzer anymore. He does not want to go by that name. In fact, he doesn't even say the name. He can't bring himself to say it, because it brings with it painful memory. I would have made that canon. I would have brought that up in the future. I would have mentioned, you know, no, I, I, I can't do that. He has now seen, for the first time, a person, by his perspective, die. And that person died speaking a name, his name. And from that point on, as he considers the name issue, and as he deals with all these other people, and other people start to die on the ship, it occurs to him he doesn't want a name. He does not want to hear that word that forevermore will be associated with that kind of pain. Because no matter what he does, he knows, logically, that he cannot save everyone. And that fact bothers him. And the best thing he can do to distance himself from it is to just call himself the Doctor. So that never more will he ever have to hear one of his patients on his table, or on an away pad, or wherever he encounters them, speak his name as they die, and forevermore remember that moment. I would have, without question and doubt, kept this into canon. I would have had this come up bef several times, and I would have had him have a, a, just a photo of the woman would have been something sufficient, just having it in the background to show that he hasn't forgotten her. Something. That is the only change I would have made to this. Now, I've, I've talked for far too long. I do apologize. I just had a lot to say, because this is a great episode, and it covers a lot of very... Uh, a lot of themes, and there was a lot of ground to cover. Hope you guys forgive me. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, rest my throat. I'm starting to have real issues. I'll talk to you guys later.